Well, hello everybody. Welcome to our service today. My name is Chad Broom and I'm the pastor of the Trinity Bible Church. Today we are studying um, or rather answering questions about our faith. And we're going to look at the subject of church today. We're going to answer four questions. The first question is, how should I choose a church? Why should I choose a church? If eternal life is free, why do I keep hearing about 10%? Isn't participation in church optional? These are questions that you may hear from other believers as well as from people outside the church and that we need to ponder on today. And so we're going to jump right in there. But let's just first pray and just commit the service to the Lord. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to open up the Bible, the Word of God, and learn from it. The body of Christ is your creation, and you are king, you are in charge of, you are head over your body, the church. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that we all would understand the high value and the importance of church and our involvement with other believers. Um, but there are some questions we need answered, and I pray, Lord Jesus, that you'd speak to our minds and our hearts today so that we can be the kind of Christ followers and a community of believers that you want us to be. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, folks, we're going to just jump right in there. This is, um, you know, this is going to be hopefully a message that you thoroughly enjoy. And as I said, we're going to start by answering a few questions. Um, and we've already mentioned those, so we'll, we'll highlight the first one right now. The first question is, how should I choose a church? How should I choose a church? All right, so what we've got here is a verse that I want you to look at. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 to 9. Um, this is, sorry, not 1 Peter, uh, 1 Corinthians um, chapter 3, verse 10 to 11. We'll look at 1 Peter in a moment. So this is what it says with regards to choosing a church. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it but each one should build with care for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid which is Jesus Christ so Paul is speaking here to the church at Corinth and he's saying there is only one foundation so here's the question we've asked we've asked the question how should I choose a church so, based on what I've just read, who is the foundation of the church? Paul is saying very clearly, Jesus is. Who is the church? Well, the church is every believer, every follower of Christ. That's the church. So the foundation of every believer is Jesus, and the foundation of the church is Jesus, because we make up the church. So how then should I choose a church? Well, one of the things that you and I must be sure of, that we must take care about, is that the church we belong to, the church we choose, is built on only one foundation, namely Jesus Christ. So that's the key issue here. How should I choose a church? Choose one with the right foundation. You've got to be critical in your evaluation in this regard, um, with regards to the church and its foundation. What foundation are you standing on? All right, there are, there are churches can be built on many foundations. It, they all ought to be built on Jesus Christ, and they will probably all claim to be built on Jesus Christ. But be critical in your evaluation because churches can be built on man-made foundations as well. They can pay lip service to the fact that they're built on Jesus, but then they can end up running in a way that reflects that they're built on something different. So let me give you a few examples of things that can be a problem. Some churches build on, on the personality of the pastor. And, and the personality of the pastor becomes one of the focuses on how they build the church, how they attract people, how they retain people. It's built, it's built on that, that personality. Um, the skill of the pastor alone, um, the attraction of the pastor alone. 
seems to be key in many of those churches. And one would ask, if that pastor were to leave, would that church maintain its flair? Some churches build around music. That's their foundation. Some build around social justice causes. Some build around trends. Whatever's trendy at the time, they seem to build around. In fact, some people take the trend issue very far and they build around what the trends are in the world. And they absorb those into the church. And those become their foundation. Some build around entertainment. Some build around gaining knowledge. Now, the reality is many of these aspects that I've mentioned are actually vital parts of church. They're vital parts of church. But they're not the foundation of the church. In fact, they're, they're more about things the church does while it's standing on its firm foundation. All of these, when they become the foundation, can mislead the church because they no longer have Christ as the one foundation that Paul is speaking about. And Paul says it doesn't matter who builds on the church. He says, I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it, but each one should build with care. Why? For no one can lay any, any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the foundation of the church. And so how do I choose a church? I choose a church that's built on Christ, that focuses on, on, on Christ, focuses on the word of God regarding Christ, and all the other things are peripheral. Now the same goes for your life and for my life. Okay? Are you building your life on Jesus? He's the only real and lasting foundation. Or are you building it on other things? Wealth, security, success, fame, knowledge. You could be building your life on those things as though those are foundations. But the Bible teaches us very clearly that those things are fleeting. They'll come and go and they won't stand up. They just won't stand up. Only Christ is the foundation that will stand. So we choose a church with Jesus and his word as the foundation. That's what we choose. That's how we choose a church. Because the rest, folks, ultimately is smoke and mirrors. Is it built on Christ? Is it steadily being built on Christ and his word? All the other things may enhance or distract and we need to be careful. And that's how you choose a church. It's got Jesus as its firm foundation. Now, why should I choose a church is also a very important question. Well, let me, let me look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 to 9. It says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Okay, now it says be alert because the devil prowls around like a roaring lion. A lion will seek out the weakest prey, the easiest target. Why spend energy on a formidable kudu, that's a massive animal, when there is a young or sickly or straggly kudu nearby. The lion can tell the difference and it intentionally and instinctively seeks out the weakest prey, the easiest target. If the weak, however, can stay in the herd, not stray from the herd, if the weak can be in the middle of the herd, there is better protection. Now, Peter in this passage is warning us to watch out for Satan. And he's telling us Satan is like a lion that prowls around seeking someone to devour. So he's warning us to watch out for Satan, particularly when we are at our lowest or our weakest. Why? Just like a lion knows how to go for the weak. Satan attacks us when we are at our lowest, when we are at our weakest. 
And this happens when we are cut off from other believers. Why should I choose a church? Because I need it. I need the fellowship of other believers. If I am cut off from other believers, I am vulnerable, I am exposed, I am weak. So never underestimate the value of actively participating, of regularly, consistently participating in church life and attending church with other Christians. A coal that, that is taken out of the fire cannot stay hot. But once you put it into the fire, it stays hot and aglow. A Christian, apart from the body of Christ, not fellowshipping with the body of Christ, cannot stay hot and aflame for Jesus. It cannot happen. The Bible is showing us that that is a problem and we need to be aware of that because when you try that model of being outside of the body of Christ and say, but I can still live happily as a Christian, well, you still will be a Christian and you'll still be serving God if you honor Him and glorify His name, but you won't be strong like if you're in that in that fellowship with other believers, you'll be stronger there. Your resistance ability will be stronger there. Now, whilst we focus on our troubles, our own troubles, we are more vulnerable to Satan's attacks. You see, when we focus on our troubles, we, we neglect other things. We forget about other things. We stop going and doing things we ought to be doing. So, so be very careful. When life throws a lemon, our natural tendency may be to disengage in the activities of life. Disengage, pull back. We use these times of challenge to stop doing routine things, primarily because we lose energy, we lose motivation, and we lose desire in those times. We're emotionally struggling. And this is when the enemy pounces, and this is why Peter is saying, be alert and of sober mind. Be aware that when you're at your weakest, the enemy pounces. And he says, this is, this is a reality. The family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kinds of sufferings. So stick together as the body of Christ. Stick together. During times of suffering, seek out other Christians' support. Keep your eyes on Christ. Resist the devil. Resist him. So why should I choose a church? Because the community of other Christians helps us stand firm. It keeps us aflame for Jesus. It guards us also from giving in to temptation. Listen to this verse. James chapter 4 verse 7 and 8. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Focus on Christ. Don't be wishy-washy. Establish your life on that firm foundation of Jesus Christ. If you're not part of the church, your foundation will also be weak. So, now, third question. If eternal life is free, why do I keep hearing about this 10% thing? Where does that come from? Okay. So, Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22 to 23 says tithes. Be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. Each of the tithe, that tenth is a tithe, each of the tithe of your grain, new wine and olive oil, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks in the presence of the Lord your God at the place he will choose as a dwelling for his name. Set the first of everything aside for God, so that you may learn to revere the Lord your God Always. So the Bible teaches, throughout the Bible, we learn the importance of tithing. There's a subtle shift and difference in the New Testament, and we'll get to that in a moment. Basically, though, we do this to show we fear God and want to put Him first. That's the primary reason. The end of that verse regarding tithing says, So that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. There's purpose in tithing. There's purpose in giving of your first fruits. Notice the verse says, so that you may learn. And learning is something that is, that is growing and developing in us 
when we observe and obey God's requirements. And we learn to revere God. And revering God means putting Him first. You see, what we do first with our money shows what we value in life. Tithing is mostly about focusing our attention on Him. It's, it's, it represents putting Jesus first, and it represents putting God first, and it represents putting our attention on Jesus and on God. That's what it represents. Far more than the monetary value it represents. Far more than what it does. When we give the, pers- the first part of our paycheck to God, it shows we are more focused on God and His ways than ourselves. Now this habit of tithing can help us keep God at the top of our priority list. And that's, that's even a, more, a clinical way to say it. Uh, this habit of tithing can help us keep God, keep Christ front and center in our lives because it's testing us. The finances, the money is testing us and it's revealing what we find important. It also reminds us that we all have, um, that what we all have comes from Him anyway. Okay, so that's the first portion. Uh, the question is, is eternal life free? And why do I keep hearing about 10%? Well, the truth is, eternal life is free. But you don't tithe to pay for eternal life. That's not what we're doing with our tithe. Okay, so now let's have a look at the next passage dealing with tithing. If eternal life is free, why do I keep hearing about 10%? Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 10 to 15. And there and here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year you were the first not only to give but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that you so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by the completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there The gift is acceptable according to what one has done. Sorry, according to what one has. Not according to what one does not have. Verse 13. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed. Paul is saying, we're not trying to make life difficult for you and while you relieve other people. But that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need. So that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. Can you see that there's a reciprocal action going on here? When you have plenty, you're able to give more to the needs of others. And then in turn, when you are in need, others, when they have plenty, can give to you. That's, that's the equality. That's the goal there. Verse 15, as it is written, the one who gathered much did not have much. And the one who gathered little did not have little. There was a degree of equality, but it wasn't so that one person suddenly had nothing and and everybody suffered. So let's have a look at that. I I see four principles of giving emerge out of this passage. And so really it's not about, it's not about um, eternal life is free, but we have to keep giving money. The church is just after my money. No, it's not the point. Our money and how we use our money represents our commitment and our devotion to God. Look at these four principles that come out of this passage from 2 Corinthians. First of all, your willingness to give enthusiastic is more important than the amount. The amount is, 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 is technically inconsequential. Your willingness to give enthusiastically, cheerful, generously, is more important than the amount. Generosity is important here too, though, but your willingness is what is important. And then if you're willing, then, then he says... You were eager to, you were willing, you had the desire. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it. Don't be just willing to give, actually give. Secondly, you should strive to fulfill your financial commitments. If you've made financial commitments, strive to fulfill them. If you've promised something towards the body of Christ, then strive to fulfill that. 
If you give to others in need, they will in turn give you when you are in need. That's the principle. And, and that's what Paul is saying. You should give to others when you have plenty, so that one day when you're in need, they will meet that need. If you never give while you have plenty, there will be many people who say, you know, he was very stingy at that time. I'm not giving him anything. And the, another principle I see here is that you should give as a response to Christ and not what you can get out of it. You see that? It's not about, I'm going to get something from God. I'm giving to get. No, I give because Christ expects it from me. I give because it shows that I love Him. I give because it, it puts Him first. I give not so that I can get something out of it. I give out of obedience. I give because Christ expects it of me. How you give, folks, reflects your devotion to Christ. That's so important. It's part of your devotional activity. It's part of your worship. So, if eternal life is free, why do I keep hearing about 10%? Eternal life is free. In that you don't purchase it with money. Money and giving test our devotion to Christ. Verse 12 adds further principles in giving. Only give as much as you are able. In other words, give in proportion to what God has given you. You see, some people give and they go too far in that giving because then their own family suffers. They've given more than they have. And Paul is saying, you don't give according to what you do not have. If your family has nothing because you chose to give your money to others in need, then you've, you're giving incorrectly. You've got to balance it out. You may give, but as long as you've also taken care of the other responsibilities. And yeah, by the way, we're not talking about frivolous luxuries in life and, and all those sorts of things. You know, we're talking about just meeting basic needs. This is not about um, if you're rich, then your children should just have money thrown at them because you're rich and you can afford it. No, you must also teach them the value of money, the value of stewarding that money. But that's, a, that's another note for another day. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 to 7, encourages generosity. Look at what that passage says. It says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So as you can see, in the Old Testament we see this 10% tithing principle, and in the New Testament we see generosity encouraged and we see all the values behind it all, all the principles that we are and why we are to give but eternal life is not connected to that giving eternal life is a free gift to you from jesus christ but it cost him his life it wasn't free to christ but your commitment your devotion to christ is tested by the way you use your money and what you do with your money and where it goes first. And now, our final question today is, isn't participation, participation in church optional? You know, I'm a Christian, but I don't really need to go to church. And I, I'm a Christian. I don't need to, um, to, to do things in church. I can sit in the pews if I do that, but I don't even always need to do that. Well, folks, let's look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25 says about participation in church. Is it optional? Are Christians required to participate in church? By participation, I mean primarily attend and be part of it. Attend it, be part of it, engage in it. All right, so Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25 says this. And let us consider how we, Christians, believers, may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, 
And all the more as you see the day approaching. The day being the end times. The day being when Christ comes again. The day being the end of the world. That time's coming and it's getting closer. And so, yeah, the writer to the Hebrews is saying, don't give up meeting together. But sadly, some are in the habit of doing that. Some rationalize that it's okay. These verses show us that participation in church is not optional. It's vital. We grow, we can draw motivation from each other in, in the body of Christ. We can worship together in the body of Christ. You see, to, to neglect Christian gatherings is to give up the encouragement and the help of other Christians. It's to give it up. It's to abandon it. It's to remove yourself as a coal from the fire. Never underestimate the value of your Christian community or the lack of it right now in your life. We gather as the church to share our faith and to strengthen each other in the Lord because the days are difficult, the night is coming, and the end is near. Persecution grows and temptations grow as we go throughout life. Neglecting church makes you more vulnerable and open to the enemy, whether it's persecution or temptation. That being said, as long as it's a church built on the right foundation, there you will find encouragement and help and comfort and motivation and spurring on to live according to God's word, to heed and yield the, the promptings of the Holy Spirit in your life. You'll be encouraged to dig into God's word and to put it into practice. And you'll have people alongside you doing it with you. That keeps us accountable, folks. That helps us through life. So, in summary, as I close, we've asked four questions. How should I choose a church? Simply, choose a church that has Jesus as its only foundation. Everything else is peripheral. Is Jesus the foundation? Jesus, the Word of God. You, are, they, are, they, are they using the Word of God? Are they taking the Word of God? Are they building their church uh, life around the Word of God? Are we being instructed from the Word of God? Secondly, why ch do I choose a church? Why do I choose a church? Because the community of other Christians helps us stand firm in our faith. That, by the way, links us to the final question that we asked about. being: Is it optional? There alone is an answer. No, it's not optional. If eternal life is free, why do I keep on hearing about 10%? Because money and giving tests our actual devotion to God. That's your litmus test. That proves a lot about your faith. But you don't buy your way into heaven. And you don't give in order to be a Christian. You come to faith because it is a free gift from Jesus Christ who loves you and died on the cross to save you from your sins. And when you accept that free gift, you give an eternal life. But to prove your devotion to God, he says, give your life, give of your life, give generously, give of your life. Everything, your first fruits, put Jesus first, in other words. And then finally, isn't participation in church optional? No, it's essential. Neglecting church makes you more vulnerable to temptation and to persecution. Why would you remove yourself from it? and suffer the consequences. Let's ask God to help us to understand the high value and importance of being in a local church. Father God, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts. If we are wandering around in the wilderness unattached to a local church, to a, to a, to a group of Christians, even if it's a, a weekly Bible study of believers gathering in someone's home, it's better than nothing. And so help us, Lord Jesus, 
to understand the high value and the high importance of engagement within the body of Christ. It's not optional. It's essential. It's vital to our spiritual well-being. And we're only fooling ourselves if we think it's okay not to do so. Forgive us. Forgive us for going against your word when we, when we simply reject out of hand and say, it's not that important. I can be a good Christian without the church. We're laughing in your face when we do that, Lord Jesus, and forgive us for that. We need to honor you and serve you faithfully, and it starts with obedience. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you help us. Thank you that you're there with us. Thank you that your Holy Spirit motivates and spurs us on. Thank you for our fellow Christians who encourage us, who come alongside us, who help to meet our needs as well. Oh, Lord Jesus. We love you, and we love the church, your body, whom we will spend eternity with anyway. So we might as well learn to get along right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go with God, folks. Have a great week.